I'm glad that you've chosen to be with us this Labor Day Sunday, and I hope you have a great Labor Day weekend. We are concluding a series this Sunday called Better, and we believe that Jesus' way is better. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. And a lot of times in churches, we emphasize the truth over the way of Jesus. And the idea of this series has been to look at the way. And if you're joining us online first time today, we're glad that you're with us. And if you tried to join us online last weekend and you had technical difficulties, we're glad you came back with us because we fixed those this week. We take our online congregation as seriously as we do the folks in the house. But I, got, I just got to tell you that if you're joining us online, it just isn't the same as being in the room. So just so you know. But we're glad you're here. And today we're going to learn about the Jesus way to pray. The way of Jesus. Now, how many of you believe in the power of prayer, but don't pray very often? How many of you are in that camp? Raise your hand. Okay, be honest. I'm raising both hands. It applies to me. So if your pastor's there, you're probably there, unless you're a prayer warrior. And I just want to invite the uh, balcony to join us today because I don't see any response because you don't think that I even know you're there. <laughs> but I feel like you're a part of us, so please join us so you can respond. Now, better is equal to the way Jesus lived. The way Jesus lived. And the way Jesus lived, he was constantly, he constantly sought the Father in prayer. Now today we're going to look at a lot of scripture, a lot of scripture fast because we just don't have enough time to really dig into all of it. But, but it's almost on every page of the Gospels. And if we want what Jesus had, then we need to pray like Jesus prayed. Because Jesus practiced the presence of of God. And so the question then is, why do we struggle to pray consistently and effectively? And I just want you to know that I get up every morning, one of the first things I do, if not the first thing, is not shave my head, but to get up, get the Bible out, get my uh, tablet out, and spend some time with God. But the weakest part of that daily routine, Saturdays and Sundays included, is my prayer time. It's the shortest and it's not the best. And I try to start today out in the presence of God. And why? Because I lack focus. I have ADHD as an adult, and I can just distract myself. I've told you that over and over again. Focus is a major concern, and so you, you need something to help you focus when you pray, to stay on track. The other thing that we lack in is confidence. That when we go before the Father, that he hears our prayer and he answers prayer. And I just want you to know, he does. Every time. Maybe not the way we want him to, but he has a purpose and he has a plan for your life. For those inconveniences, those struggles, those frustrations, those temptations, those trials, whatever. And the other is that we lack faith. We lack faith. Uh, I have a, a, a friend that doesn't come to church very often, who, who is not quite sure about the whole existence of God thing, and, and, and I find it fascinating. He says, well, Chris, why do you guys pray so much during your service? And I, I kind of gave him a blank look, I know, because I thought, we don't pray that much. We don't pray that much. We might have a communion prayer, we might have an offering prayer, I might have a pastoral prayer at the end of service, but we don't pray that much in worship. And, but they, to him, it was a lot. Isn't that fascinating? So to understand what prayer is, start with what prayer is not. I want to share with you some things that prayer is not. First of all, prayer is not a formal presentation. It's not a research pray, paper. It is not praying to God in, in the word, not, not wrong, but praying his word to remind him of who he is and what he said. It's not, I don't go to my dad when I call him on the phone, and by the way, they're probably watching, but I don't say, oh, great father, how art thou? How dost thou do today? 
Dost thou want me to tell you the words that you taught me in the days past? No, I don't do that. I say, hey, Dad, how you doing? What's going on? How, how's Mom? How are you? How's, how's uh, the football or the basketball team or whatever you're watching and whatever you're doing at the RV park retirement place? How's it going? It's, it's not formal. It's informal. It's casual because of our relationship. And prayer is not giving God a wish list. God, I want this and this and this, and will you do this and will you do that? No, it's relational. Prayer is not a spiritual negotiation. If you do this, God, I will do that. God does not negotiate. He, you're not a hostage negotiator, and he's not a hostage. He will do his will. Some of you may be here because you made a deal with God. God, you don't deal with God. God deals with you. And prayer is not a performance to impress God or other people. Jesus warned us about this act of the Pharisees who would stand on a street, street corner and pray out loud and make it a public performance. No, that's not what God is about. That's not what prayer is about. Jesus teaches us that prayer isn't just an action that you do. Prayer is the way that you live. Not an action. It's the way that we are to live. That is what a follower of Jesus, that's how they live. If you're a follower of Jesus and you're not in prayer, then are you really a follower of Jesus? Prayer is the way that Jesus lived. If we follow Jesus, we'll follow his way. Prayer will be a part of our life. It will be the way that we live. What's fascinating is Jesus was God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We believe in the Trinity because it's taught in the Bible. Actually, in the Bible, it's called the Godhead. Jesus was God, but yet he prioritized the presence of God in his life. He wanted that true connection with God. Now, you may not believe me that Jesus practiced the presence of God and was praying all the time. But let me just run you through some scriptures. These are just 28 scriptures that I'm going to hit really, really quick. Jesus prayed at his baptism in the morning before heading to Galilee after healing people. All night before choosing his disciples while speaking to the Jewish leaders, giving thanks to the Father before feeding the 5,000. Before walking on water, Jesus prayed. I would pray before I walked on water while heading, <laughs> healing a deaf and mute man. Giving thanks to the Father before feeding 4,000. Jesus prayed. Before Peter called Jesus the Christ, he prayed. At the transfiguration, he prayed. At the return of the 70, he prayed. Before teaching the disciples the Lord's Prayer, before he taught them to pray, he prayed. Before raising Lazarus from the dead, he prayed. For the little children, he prayed. Asking the Father to glorify his name, he prayed. At the Lord's Supper, he prayed. When Satan asked to sift Peter, he prayed. I'm not done yet. He prayed for himself. He prayed for his disciples. He prayed all believers before heading to Gethsemane. 26 verses in John chapter 17. He prayed. In Gethsemane, before his betrayal, he prayed. He prayed three separate prayers in that moment. Right after being nailed to the cross, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. While dying on the cross, Jesus cried out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And by the way, I hope somebody notices that the TV went off. In his dying breath, Jesus prayed, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. A blessing on the bread before he ate with others after his resurrection, he prayed. And he prayed, Blessing on the disciples before his ascension as he sent them out, Jesus prayed. I counted them. There are 28 times, and maybe 30 if you count the three different prayers he prayed uh, in Gethsemane. And that was just uh, an overview of what Jesus and how Jesus prayed and lived. You see, prayer isn't just an action you do. Prayer is a way that you live. 
We start the day, we should start the day in prayer in the presence of God and live every moment in the presence of God. That is how Jesus did it. And so if Jesus did it, we're a follower of Jesus, then we should do it. You see, to be effective in this world, we have to disconnect from it. To be effective, to be present for God, to live for God, for Christ, to, to live differently as we are the called out ones, the chosen ones. We are a peculiar people. And that, you know, some of you are just plain odd anyway. But we are called to be different because we live in the Spirit of God, in the presence of God. So we disconnect from what doesn't last, the temporary, to connect to the one who does, to the eternal. It's just simply that way. And when we live in the eternal presence of God, the temporary doesn't seem as important, and we realize what is going on. Jesus said it this way in Matthew 6, verse 6. He says, but when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. In the message, it says it this way, and I kind of like this translation in this moment. It's a devotional. It's not a literal translation. It's not something you base your faith and your doctrine on, but it says, here's what I want you to do. This is what Jesus said how he phrases it in message. Find a quiet, secluded place so you won't be tempted to role play before God. Just be there as simply and honestly as you can manage. The focus will shift from you to God and you will begin to sense his grace. Do you have that place in your life? I have this chair in our house that is in a secluded place that's shut off from everything else where I meet God in the morning. And I stop and I, I listen. If I'm on, on point, and I'm not always on point, sometimes the devotional time becomes a checklist for me, and then I don't celebrate the presence of God in that day. And I am still in that moment. We are called to be still in the presence of God, to allow God's grace and his spirit to rest on us, to be with us that we can celebrate his presence all throughout today. And that's an intimate time. It's an intimate moment. And intimacy is never accidental. It requires time. It requires intention. It, it, it requires focus. It requires presence. And if you don't have intimacy with God, it's probably because you haven't planned and prepared for that moment and, and to spend your time with him. You might ask, well, what do I pray about? And I would say, whatever you care about. <sighs> whatever you care about. I just want you to know that I'm not a really a vindictive person. I'm not a vengeful person. But every once in a while, I'll be a little frustrated and I will be a little angry and somebody w will have taken advantage of me. And I'm not vindictive and I'm not vengeful, but I just want to slit every tire that they own. <laughs> I don't think I'm very vengeful. I think that's fair. Yeah. If you take advantage of me for thousands of dollars, I want payback. And so I go to the Father and I say, okay, God, you know who I am, you know I'm your follower. And I'm your child. I just want to remind you who I am, Father. I want you to take them out. <laughs> I want you to curse them. I want you to, you know, tornadoes, earthquakes. I want you to rah, 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 to them. Whatever. God, you're really good at this. Just take care of it. And by the time I prayed that prayer and said my you know, cursing and my uh, vindictive nature that I have, that I have to withhold and, and, and hold back. You know, God's grace is, and his spirit is convicted me of my uh, inappropriate and selfish and vindictive, vengeful prayer. And then I, I realize that, you know, God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay it, pay, and I don't need to do that, take that in my own hands. 
God's going to deal with it, and they are his children. He wants them to come to salvation. He wants them to come to grace. And guess what? God takes care of business in, in our lives. We don't have to do that. We don't have to respond that way. And, and let me just say that if you're like me and some of, a, of you are even worse than me, well, I know you, that God does that. And we don't have to respond that way because the Spirit of God is in you and he will respond accordingly. He will help you. Philippians 4, 6, one of my favorite passages, and I will say that I've memorized it and I've practiced this in my life for the last 35, 40 years of ministry because it's so appropriate. It says, don't worry about anything, but instead pray about everything. Now, now God answers prayer, but he also, it's a transforming work that he does in our lives. I've got a picture this morning I want to share with you. Maybe you guys can identify it. I asked first service, I asked first service what it was. I asked them to raise their hands because some of them did not go to school with one of these. Now, for our OCD people who, who like their food separated from, from each other, this is a perfect cafeteria tray for you. This is the way life ought to be for you. And I just want you to know, that's not reality, but, but, but you better buy one of these and, and keep it at your house. For the rest of us, this was where we had the introduction, maybe, if your parents didn't do this, of mashed potatoes with noodles on top. Very Midwestern. I noticed my friends from the East Coast don't do that. That's like sacrilegious, carbohydrate with carbohydrate. Not in the Midwest. That's the way we like it. The West Coast, if you're from the West Coast, hey, you got some awakening to, to occur food-wise because we fry everything, and if it doesn't have fat, if it doesn't have carbs, we don't eat it around here. It's where I was introduced to chili soup and peanut butter sandwiches. When I got married, my wife didn't know about peanut butter sandwiches. She, she didn't know that you were supposed to eat chili with peanut butter sandwiches because she wasn't from around here. But I grew up that way, so you can't have chili without peanut butter sandwiches. I learned that on that tray. Folks, when we pray, our lives aren't to be compartmentalized like that tray. Actually, it's like one plate, and our whole life is like our food mixed together. And that, you know, for your OCD people that don't want your food to be mixed up, that's the way our life is supposed to be. Our whole life is about being in tune with God. We just don't do Sunday morning and then forget about God for the rest of the week. No, we live in a communion and presence with God through prayer every day, all day, every moment. You see, God doesn't want to be a part of your life. He is your life. That's the way God intended us to live. You see, because prayer isn't just an action you do. It is a way you live. Paul writes it this way in 1 Thessalonians 5.17. And I'm going to use three different translations. Repeat after me. I'll see if you're more awake, if this later hour causes you to be more awake than the first service. Repeat after me. Never stop praying. Never stop praying. That's good. Pray continually. Pray without ceasing. Pray without ceasing. That is how we were intended to pray. Prayer is living in God's presence. It is allowing his spirit to work inside of our lives completely, wholly, totally. If you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit residing in you. It's allowing that indwelling, that continual filling to happen. Prayer is breathing in God's grace. I don't think there's anything finer than that to breathe in God's grace, to, to recognize his presence, but to, to know his grace is all we need. I was talking to some guys this morning that weren't quite sure about their salvation, that if Jesus would return today, whether they'd go to heaven or to hell. So I grew up around people like that. 
And I just have to remind him that God's grace is sufficient. He's our Father. He loves us like crazy. He wants every one of us to live and to know him eternally, to be in his kingdom, to be in heaven with him. You can't lose your salvation like that. Saved by grace through faith. Prayer isn't just getting God to do what we want. It's aligning our will to his will. It's getting in alignment with God, no matter what the circumstance, the event. It's realizing that he is working in the conviction of sin in our hearts. It's his comfort in our trials. It's knowing his direction in our life. He is hurting over what hurts us, and it's rejoicing in those moments. Yesterday, our grandson, three-year-old, came, came to our house. I get a kick out of him every day. He, he, he does things every day that requires my attention and my focus. Yesterday, he brought a piece of cardboard. It was about like this big by this big. It, says, it, it said, Marshall's sign. And I don't know, you know, you see, you've seen these people that are out on the street twirling their sign and wrapping it around them and putting it around their head, throwing it up in the air and catching it and turning around, you know, doing all those things. So he did that yesterday afternoon. Cutest thing I ever saw. Now, probably not cute to you because he's not your grandchild, obviously. But rejoicing in those moments that make us smile and to laugh and to enjoy it. Max Cato encourages me because as a pastor, I always feel guilt for not praying enough, for not praying enough for you. And I pray for most of you a lot. And I always feel guilty. Max Cato says it this way, I always felt like a prayer failure. That adds some guilt, doesn't it? But he says, pray when you are waking when you get up in the morning, pray. Thank God for the day that he's in control. Pray when you are waiting. You ever get stuck in traffic in line and you're just a little frustrated? In the Old Testament, waiting is the same word as hoping. Pray when you're waiting. Pray when you're whispering under your breath. It's amazing. I can talk to my wife and she can't hear me, but if I mumble something under my breath, <laughs> she can hear that loud and clear. What do you whisper about? What do you, what do you mumble about under your breath? That is a topic for prayer. And pray when the day is waning at the end of the day, reflecting on the day and the joys and the struggles and the trials the things that occur in our lives. 1 John 5, 14, 15, John writes it this way. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know what, that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. He is a good, good father. He's a good, good God who loves you like crazy. I don't know a good dad that doesn't want to help his kids every way they possibly can. Want to make life better for them. Sometimes we instruct them very loudly because we think that loudly might get their attention. Typically it doesn't. But we want the best for them. And sometimes we give them what they want. And other times we don't because it is not good for them. They need to work for it. They need to learn. They need to make some better decisions. And God does that to us. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, how I memorized it was, don't be anxious for anything, but in every situation, in every circumstance, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, and the peace of God, the shalom, the wholeness, the wellness, the peace, the presence of God exists in us, which transcends all understanding. You see, the world won't understand it. The culture won't understand it. 
because we are different because there is a God that we have faith in, that we put our faith and our trust. And so we have his peace and it will guard our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus when we put our trust in him through prayer. Because prayer isn't just an action you do. Prayer is the way you live. That's how God designed us. That's how God designed you to live in his presence every moment with him. Those struggles, those trials, those temptations won't be as great when we live in his presence, when we are actively communicating in an intimate relationship with him. That's how we live. That's how we are called to live. That's the way the kingdom works. That is praying the way Jesus prayed. Will you please stand as I pray? Father God, we're thankful for the example that you've given us through the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we're thankful that there's a way to communicate with you intimately, personally, deeply, our heart, our hurts, our frustrations, our joys. And Father, we're thankful for the blessing that we have in even knowing you in that intimate way through your spirit that only came through the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, as we come to you, we ask that prayer would be an intimate, integral part of our lives, that it would be the way that we live in communion with you in, pre in your presence in communication with you because we know that you have it all and you are for us and we're reminded that you love us so very very much and we thank you Father that you are God and that you are our Father and we give all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen.